Welcome to Cinemaholics, the major motion podcast where we talk about the biggest and the best films coming to theaters and streaming online from San Francisco, the Bay Area, that is. I'm John Agroni, film editor for theyoungfolks.com, and from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, he's... Hmm. Will? What? Why are you wearing a suit? Is that a tuxedo? Uh, oh, this is awkward. I thought hmm. we were dressing up for this special occasion. Oh, no. This is, Here we uh, go again. Now, here I am with just t-shirt and jeans huh. yeah yeah well he's a news and entertainment writer at collider he's as formal as it gets it's will ashton mm. hello looking great uh you can find more episodes of our show on cinemaholics.com our whole archive everything you want written reviews video reviews everything and uh, you can write into the show anytime by sending us an email we love reading your emails we frame them on our walls we put them out and you do? show them to our parents our emails, as always, is cinemaholicspodcast at gmail.com. I mean, I do that, Will. I, I don't know. Oh, I must have missed that, that uh, part of the house when you gave mm-hmm. me the tour. Uh, oh, my- that must be uh, a private room. No, it was, it was right there on the fridge. Oh, I see. Yeah, you just, you know, you never went over for a snack. And so if you'd like uh, to support this podcast and help us keep the lights on, you can head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash cinemaholics. Uh, you know, Will. Yep. We're talking about a movie that, you know, it, it's been an interesting week and a, a sure. lot, of, lot of stuff's been flying. I guess. We only, have, we only have time to talk about one movie. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, uh, I'm glad we're finally recording this thing, but it has been uh, a bit of a process, I guess, to actually get recording. Uh, I don't know if we need to detail the, uh, the rigmarole that resulted in us uh, doing it this late, but um, well, yeah, yeah, it's it's funny because we could just talk about we, we could have just talked about Jurassic World Dominion, which we've already seen. Yes, um, we're going to let that sit a little bit longer. Yeah, we've yeah. we could be talking about that. We could be talking about Fire Island, which we both have seen. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, no, we, that's coming. Uh, it's, it's it's just next week. We're gonna sit down. We're gonna have a conversation. We're gonna let the box office happen. You know, yeah. see how uh, see how that stuff goes. But we're gonna but, talk about yeah. uh, a film that I think, arguably, is uh, better than both those films. Moon film, D- David Cronenberg. Cronenberg. Yeah, nothing against uh, Fire uh, Island, yeah. which uh, we'll talk about uh, I was next week. Say, I, guess. I yeah, I I, I thought. Fire Island was a big old sweetie of a movie, and so I'll say real quick. I mean, if you're gonna, if you're if you're home this weekend and you're you're not feeling the theater, if you just want to hang out, sit 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 back, watch something, comfort food movie, Fire Island is a great time. It's on Hulu. I, I very much enjoyed it. Uh, but yeah, we'll have, we'll have more of a conversation about it next week. Well, I have a question for you regarding David Cronenberg. Sure. Do you, you like his films? I do. Yeah, I thought you were going to do something like, what's this guy's deal or something like that, to which... Well, I, mean, I would I never give, put that on yeah, you. Yeah, um, I was going to say, <laughs> that's, that's a tall order, but I could try my best to explain it. But no, I'm a big fan of his. Um, I haven't seen every one of his films. Uh, probably the most glaring uh, blind spot for me is, uh, and one I don't think I actually told you about, uh, is The Fly. I've actually never seen David Cronenberg's really? The Fly. But I've seen all the other from him that kind of ruined my life. Really? (laughs) I remember Uh, seeing it as a kid and it really freaked me out. um, But I think I've seen most of the other major ones. Like the the, the only other blind spots I have are some of the smaller films like Spider uh, and Butterfly uh, Existence, uh, which is, I guess, like the last of the like traditional David Cronenberg body horror type films. Um, but I've seen like, you know, I've seen like Dead Ringers, I've seen Videodrome, I've seen uh, Scanners, I've, ski- I've seen Naked Lunch, which is probably my favorite of his. I don't know about you, but... Um, which one? Naked Lunch? Yeah, Naked Lunch is probably my favorite. I uh, haven't seen it, that one. That's the one with Peter Weller? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I would say, uh, probably one of the best... Uh, cinematic depictions of writing I've ever seen in a film. So I'm a little biased on that one, I think. But, yeah. uh, and also just the fact that he was able to adapt 
a William S. Burroughs book at all, I think is pretty amazing <laughs> uh, in a way that is uh, at least semi-coherent. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know. I, I certainly love that film. I love Videodrome. Uh, that's an amazing film. I know you you're a fan of that film, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. You, you saw that one at the lovely Castro Theater, you told me, this uh, past month. Or yeah, you, you told favorite, me that. Yeah. One yeah. of my favorite double features ever. It, it followed um, They Live. Oh, okay. And it was just like, mm, perfect double feature. Wow. Yeah. I mean, so uh, suffice it to say, I uh, really do enjoy David Cronenberg's films. Um, oh, Crash, too. Crash, I just actually saw that. That's, I was about uh, to say, I was, like, I was thinking about Crash quite a bit. Um, um yeah. watching this one crash um, I actually just saw for the first time last year uh it became one of my favorites mm-hmm. of his uh yeah not to be confused of course with the best picture winning film of the same name which is ironically significantly worse <laughs> uh than <laughs> david cronenberg's crash but i digress yeah hey, it came out a decade before uh the only other movie i would i would put out there in terms of like okay if you want to maybe get into the Cronenberg game is, uh, I think a history of violence is terrific. One of the best adaptations yep. of a graphic novel put to film. It is, uh, uh truly terrific. The first Cronenberg film I ever saw was history of violence. That was also, oh, I think yeah. one of the first R rated films I ever saw. Um, if oh, wow. I, if I recall correctly, uh, but you know what the interesting, uh, factoid about history of violence is like from a film history standpoint, Mm, put it on me it is the last film to be widely distributed on vhs oh wow i did not know that yeah and you know it's funny because it it has a v it has an h and it has an s yeah i didn't even think about that but that is true (laughs) i mean yeah uh uh, you know it doesn't start with s but there s is in the title i mean i'll I'll allow you that yeah (laughs) oh man um I also, you know, Cronenberg likes to show up in his film or something, you know, from time to time, you know, it's like um, little cameos. Does he show uh, up in his films or does he show up more in other people's films? Both. He, he shows up in a lot of other things, too. Yeah. He, he showed up in Viggo Mortensen's uh, right. Falling. Falling. Yeah. Him showing up in that. But no, he was in, uh, he has a cameo on the fly and Shivers and a mm-hmm. couple other ones, I want to say. Yeah, I mean. But, uh, but not I don't think this it, one. I was gonna say it's not really like a like a Hitchcock thing where he makes a point to always cameo yeah. in his films or Shyamalan, yeah, or something like that. I mean, yeah, I, I feel like he's more commonly like showing up in other people's films than he is in his. But I mean, he does. Yeah, you are right. He has, he has uh, cameo sometimes in his own films, which directors but are wont to do sometimes. Strikes. Yeah. yeah. Um. So anyway. I haven't seen uh, his most r- recent couple of movies, Cosmopolis or Maps to the Stars. Um, I, I have don't know why. Uh, <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I know um, those were a couple of films that helps sort of, uh, I don't want to say revitalize Robert Pattinson's career, but kind of because obviously his career well, was doing really well after Twilight, but they, they were kind of like right. legitimizing films for him as an indie star, right? Uh, they paved the way, I'd say. I'm yeah. personally not crazy about cosmopolis or maps to stars i found those to be both kind of uh lesser efforts from david cronenberg um i I don't know where you stand on eastern promises or a dangerous method which are his other two more recent films um but which i I certainly really do enjoy eastern promises and uh, i I like dangerous method fine um i feel like there's probably a better film in there and I, i also kind of feel like Cronenberg making a movie about Freud is maybe putting a hat on a hat, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, yeah. but you know, I, I did, mean, I, I did like it, but yeah. What was that? I did like a dangerous method. Yeah. It's a good, it's a pretty good film. I mean, I feel like it's solid. That was the last one of his before this one. That I remember being like, okay, we got like the juice is flowing and then Cosmopolis. I feel like it, it's very like, um, you know, it, it, it's definitely very talky. It's very, uh, you know, theological, I guess. Like it, it has a lot of the Cronenberg like trademarks in some respects, certainly towards the end, but it also just doesn't really, I don't think it ever really comes to life in a way that his other movies, uh, tend to. And then maps of stars. I don't know. Maybe I just need to revisit, but I just found it to be, uh, kind of a, an overworked Hollywood satire. Didn't really. Well, this is, Hit this the is mark Cronenberg. For me. That was 2014. I mean, it's been yeah. almost a decade. And yeah. Um, his son has made a film in that time. 
And his daughter, um, I think. Uh, I think both of his kids have made films, or two of his kids have made films. Um, which film did his daughter make? I'd have to look it up, but I'm pretty sure this is like a big year for the Cronenbergs. Cause I think him, obviously he has a film this year. I believe Brandon has a film this year. And I think his daughter also has a film this year. I would probably have to look that up. Cause I'm, I'm not familiar with the career of, cause I think his daughter's name is Caitlin, but I'm not familiar with her career as a filmmaker. Um, I know she was like worked for like variety and stuff like that, but, um, or has done stuff for variety, but um his son though we talked about his film um so brendan cronenberg he did possessor a couple years back one of my favorite films of that year and i did get the sense when i was watching this i was like oh man he's he was inspired by his kid how how sweet how nice you know little little competition in the 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 cronenberg home i can't even imagine growing up there but uh (laughs) i guess uh he also made crimes of the future like a different version of that same title, uh, which you you watched for the first time recently, right? It's also called Crimes of the Future. It was one of his first things he ever did. It was like a not yeah. a short film, but kind of like a something in between a short film and a feature. It's an hour long feature. Yeah. Um, it's it's available on YouTube if you ever want to check it out. Though, unfortunately, I can't say I recommend it. Um, it it's it's uh, totally totally unrelated to this movie, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, outside of the title, and then like a few kind of like general kind of vague similarities uh it it definitely doesn't have like you could watch either film and not you know feel lost as far as like you you if you haven't seen the one you can see the other okay fair enough fair enough yeah but uh that one yeah uh that one's like the premise is uh women have gone extinct because of some sort of uh um cosmetic pandemic sort of thing and now men are like becoming more effeminate and like kind of like exploring their bodies in different ways and stuff like that. It has like an, it's a type of film that I think it's a curio for Cronenberg. And you can see the, the Cronenberg that will come to be in certain individual scenes. But as a film, I think it's not super compelling or super well made. It, it's a second film. And I feel like it's the type of film that, you know, it's an early filmmaker trying to kind of find his style and not quite finding it yet. But if you are a fan of Cronenberg, it is an interesting watch to be sure. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so his new film, also called Crimes of the Future, I guess is a, you know, similar, I guess, in a couple of like very passing senses. This one he wrote and directed. He hasn't written a film uh, as often in years past. Like he did write Cosmopolis, but yeah, Maps of the Stars, I don't think he was the writer on that. I don't think he wrote anything since, like, maybe the 90s, aside from Cosmopolis. And this film, it um, stars... Yeah. Well, he, did, he wrote a novel called Consumed, which I guess he's uh, thinking about turning into a film. But uh, as far as films are concerned, yeah, I don't think he's written anything. Yeah. But this script was from, uh, I think, the late 90s, early years 2000s. Ago. Yeah. I was about to mention that, yeah. yeah and he has reportedly said that he didn't really like change anything or mess with the script at all. Um, so he was saying this, uh, cause this film premiered at the, the con film festival this year. That's and fascinating. It, yeah. Hmm? I said, it's fascinating. I didn't know that. I thought he might've changed some things, but yeah, I didn't realize that. He, he claims that he didn't. Uh, it, I mean, you can kind of read between the lines. Maybe he like did some little updates. Yeah. But he originally was going to make this film, um, in 2003, it was called painkillers. And uh, same same idea. Uh, if you kind of like look into what the premise was, it's like pretty much exactly the same. Ray Fiennes was going to be the star, and uh, I think they even had Nicolas Cage in conversation to be in it at one point. But no, they they just they never entered production, and he got busy with other projects, and he got lost, he lost interest in it. But then he went back to it. I guess he you know he he opened up the old. Um, he opened up the old like moleskin and was just like, all right, it's time. I think that people are ready for the future. They're ready for these crimes. That said, well, I'm, I'm going to say something. Uh, I think that, uh, <clears throat> it kind of shows that he didn't really change the script in 20 years. Uh, oh, Will doesn't look happy that I said that. So the film stars Vigo Mortensen, Leia Sidhu and Kristen Stewart among plenty of, plenty of other people. I, I, I do really like this cast. 
But I, I, I got to get this out of the way. Well, I, we're going to talk about the premise. I, I think this is going to be a little bit of a fight. I think it's going to be a little bit of a, a classic Will and John shakedown, you know, in the streets, okay. in the alleys. Um, well, uh, can I clarify actually one thing before I forget that I said earlier that I misspoke on? Uh-huh. Um, so Brandon Cronenberg does have a film coming out this year. It's called Infinity Pool. Uh but neither of his daughters have a film, though. I think I was getting confused with, as you mentioned, Caitlin Cronenberg. Uh, she made a short film slash NFT, which is a bizarre thing to say. But uh, she made The Death of David Cronenberg, which is a like a one minute short film that came out last year. So I think that's what I was thinking of. But I just wanted to clarify before I uh, forgot. It's an understandable anyway. mistake yeah. considering because she's she's done a lot of work. And then I know um, Denise Cronenberg uh who i think i think is his david's sister i'm gonna say um is a costume designer i mean the whole family they love them some films so i'm a fan okay so the premise of this movie crimes of the future it takes place in the maybe near horror or near horror near future uh and the idea of it is that for some reason um is it climate change is it pollution we don't really know, but we have essentially sort of uh, technology and human beings have evolved to the point where we people just don't really feel pain anymore. We have these sort of like synthetic machines that can essentially control our bodily functions better, and the human body is doing more unpredictable things because we can't feel pain as humans. People are now able to do surgery on themselves. They're able to, you know, morph and mutilate their bodies for fun, for pleasure. So we have characters, our main characters here, Viggo Mortensen and Leah Sedu, who are a performance art couple, and their performance art literally is mutilating themselves on screen. Uh, specifically, Leia Sedu does surgery on Viggo Mortensen, who is a guy who, for whatever reason, has a mutation that grows like extra organs that are totally new and that don't, you know, yet exist. And it is the the hottest sensation. It is their version of a fashion yeah. runway. It's it's the entertainment of the day. There aren't there aren't smartphones. There aren't any sort of like any sort of like flights of fancy that we understand mm-hmm. it as today. It really is David Cronenberg's sort of vision of like, what if, you know, of the future. Sure. Um, it's pretty analog and it's very like, you know, we're, we're finding ways to adapt to the synthetic lifestyles of tomorrow. Uh, one of the funny quirks about this movie too, is that the national organ uh, registry is like this very bureaucratic thing. There are only like two people who work for it because it's like become such a, kind of useless, you know, fruitless sort of thing in, in this kind of world. It's a movie with a lot of lore. It's kind of a noir as well. It's got a lot of the body horror, but a lot of it follows these characters sort of kind of um, debating whether or not they're going to do a performance art thing that has to, that is related to a murder of a child who, for reasons that are currently unspecified, was murdered by his own mother because he showed signs of doing something that the human body probably shouldn't be able to in a world where <laughs> these these human beings probably shouldn't be able to do what they're doing. I I, I got to be honest. Well, I, I I appreciate this movie in terms of I think the lore is really fascinating. I love the existential questions. I love a lot of scenes in this. Like there are just like times when characters are doing things and they are kind of engaging with each other in ways that are like, what if aliens kind of like looked at our society and made a movie about it and tried to like speculate on our behalf. And it, it, it's a great thought experience. It's a great conversation starter of a movie for cinephiles, but this movie is mostly just characters talking to each other, going to different rooms and having kind of conversations about things. And it just kind of goes from this scene to this scene to this scene. It's not a very interesting movie to watch. I found myself pretty slog through it. The conversations they're having just really come down to why did this person do this thing? And it's like this scene is like now we're in this room talking to this person. There just isn't a lot of characters doing things in a movie where that's supposed to be, I think, the interesting thing is them doing things. Now, when they do sort of like engage and have a conversation and like 
the setting of it, the atmosphere of it actually does have some kind of movement. That's when I was most engaged. But yeah, for the most part, I found this thing to be remarkably slow and tame for Cronenberg. And I, I was left kind of wanting. But what did you think of the movie, Will? Do you agree or disagree? Uh, well, I mean, I've already made it clear that I like the film. Um, before I kind of go into my thoughts, I'm kind of more curious to dive into why you feel like the script shows that was written two decades earlier. I don't really take issue with anything else you said, because that's your personal opinion. But that's the one thing I'm kind of getting hung up on. I'm curious if you could elaborate more on that. I don't I don't find the structure very polished. And okay. I get the sense that it, it feels like a bit of a first draft. It okay. feels like something he kind of like laid out and was kind of like, oh, you know, and then he had an opportunity, I think. And, and again, I'm taking his word for it. Right. Sure. I think he he had an opportunity to maybe update it and to really like bring it to bear and make something that, you know, was a little bit more advanced. That was a little bit more reflective of how he's changed as a filmmaker over the years. And I don't know. I, I didn't really get that sense. Hmm. I thought you I thought you meant more like it was outdated in it's like sensibilities or something like that. Uh, no, no, I, no. Cause okay. it's, it's its own thing in that regard, isn't it? Well, that's what I think. I mean, you know, it's, it's absolutely the most Cronenbergian film we've gotten in probably the 21st century. Uh, which is, I think why I'm partly why I'm so endeared to it. It's the type of film that I've wanted Cronenberg to make, you know, since the 2000s, even though I really do love, like we said, history of violence and uh, Eastern promises. This is like, OK, this is that return to form in a way that I've been looking for. And I think for me, why I find myself more endeared to the film is for reasons that you've suggested, but not really outlined, which is that it is a film essentially about David Cronenberg and his process. Uh, Viggo Mortensen's character is an artist, as you mentioned, who like literally puts his guts out there, like spills his guts, kind of like has the guts to kind of uh, reveal himself as an artist. It's a very painful, but also very liberating and meaningful process for him. But it's something that's kind of going out of fashion while also influencing a new generation of artists who have the provocative nature of his work, but in his view, don't really, uh, you know, showcase the same sort of uh, depth or nuance or really have that same sort of uh, intrigue or, you know, passion. It just kind of seems kind of odd and uh, sensational. And you can kind of look into that in different ways. I mean, Certainly, like certain uh, like Teton last year earned a lot of comparisons, as we mentioned, to Crash, which is a film I really like. But I could see Cronenberg watching that film and kind of sharing Viggo Mortensen's characters like uh, trepidation for like why, you know, people are really comparing this to his film or even like we said, like his own son's films, which I mean, I, I like Possessor and I thought uh, Antiviral was pretty good, but it's kind of hard to watch those films and not think about his father's like if he had directed them, what he would have done with them. And so for me, I, I think it's really just a not uh, tame film, but rather a more tender film exploring one's artist place in a world that is at once uh, evolving uh, because of him, but evolving away from him. And an artist trying to figure out like, okay, I still want to make art. I still want to create it, even if it pains me to do so. But where is my place? Am I out of touch? Am I like out of step with where things are going? And to me, I find that to be a very beautiful and sad kind of meditation on what art is and, you know, this desire to make art, even if it is like gross and bizarre and people don't really fully understand it or even want to understand it. And I think all this stuff with Viggo Mortensen's character is really compelling and moving for that reason. Now the, the second narrative where we kind of get into, like you said, like with Scott Speedman's character and his son, that's where I kind of like I, I can kind of drift in and out. Like, I think it's interesting, but I don't know if it always fully connects with the main narrative. But I think it really ties together well with an end scene that I've been thinking about a lot since uh, I've seen the film, which is admittedly a couple of days ago. But uh, yeah, I'm certainly, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's like an A tier Cronenberg film, but I think this is a B or a high B Cronenberg film for sure. I think that ending scene, I mean, I think he's trying to evoke the passion of Joan of Arc. Uh, probably, in my opinion, the greatest silent film ever made. One of the greatest films ever sure. made. And it's bold. 
bold of him to do that. I respect the I respect the hustle. Yeah, I mean, I, not to be repetitive, I, I think it, that's really what it comes down to for me is it's just the story. I think like the atmosphere, the imagery, the characters themselves, the acting, the the swings that he's going for, where he's trying to make something really gross also kind of thrilling to watch. I mean, that's 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 what Cronenberg does best, right? And I was happy to see him return to that form. But yeah, it's just, it's the plot machinations. It's just, you know, scenes that kind of just play out without much energy. And it it's not even a very long movie. It, it, you can kind of tell. And, and I, I don't know, I was watching this movie and when it ended, it just felt like we were missing a third act. Like it, it felt hmm. like a lot of these character threads didn't get tied up. I kind of struggled with like, did I miss something with the Kristen Stewart character? Because I did not oh, I get the sense that, her, her character char- well that's the thing i liked her character a lot i ki- i wish there was more of her and i wish that we had kind of finished her story arc in some kind of way i feel like she just sort of disappears from the film at one point and i i was very confused about that like i was like did they did they cut stuff out because it just it felt like we were missing something there um but you know i'm i'm on board when it comes to what cronenberg is trying to say about our future and kind of you know doing this very creative imagining of what could it be like if humanity evolved just like one step further you know what i mean like you know what it's an it's an interesting thought experiment like i said before it's something that i love i would love to talk about you know in uh, in more detail with somebody like right after watching the movie i guess the problem is like right after watching the movie I didn't want to talk about it. I was kind of just like, okay, you know, I kind of moved on very quickly from it, but I don't know. Do you think this is a movie that's going to kind of, uh, be that film for a lot of people or they're going to uh, watch it and it's going to stick with them and they're going to have like fruit, like long conversations. I mean, I, th- I certainly think it's a, a better, uh, meteor film than you are suggesting, but, um, you know, to slightly, I guess nice, I'm not saying it's okay. All right. Well, I was going to, uh, you know, say that uh, to semi agree with what you're s- saying, I do think this is maybe deliberately, maybe just by nature of Cronenberg being a nearly 80 year old filmmaker, a more lethargic, uh, tired film, though. I think in this case, it actually lends to the film, whereas I thought those qualities were seen in Maps of Stars and in uh, Cosmopolis, but in a way that I found detrimental to those films, primarily because they were centered more on younger, uh, more outlandish characters, Uh, certainly uh, outlandish in the case of Maps of Stars and younger in the case of Cosmopolis. And I felt like that uh, kind of heavy, world-weary style didn't really fit those films. Like It felt like it, it, it... Cronenberg wasn't really able to to give the energy and the heft that were needed to really tell those stories properly, as well as I think the budget limitations of um, Maps to Stars was pretty apparent. And you could say the same, I guess, about this film, though I I guess I added more to the charm of it. I really enjoyed the practical effects in this film. Uh, I felt like the fact that everything was kind of run down and weary uh, added to the state of mind of Viggo Mortensen's character, this idea of an artist who, like we said, you know, in Cronenberg fashion is like kind of existentially uh, wound up. Like he's kind of wondering exactly what his place is. It's not so much about like him trying to prove himself because he's already done that, but rather just trying to prove if he can still have like meaningful uh, moving art. And I don't know, I just, I really do think about this film a decent bit. I mean, certainly one that I don't know if it'll be like in my top 10 or top 20 by the year's end. But it is a film that I have uh, really appreciated uh, upon reflection. One that I also quite enjoyed while watching it. Though I will admit that, like, yeah, there are a couple scenes in this where, you know, it did kind of feel like it was spinning its wheels a little bit. Uh, It did kind of feel like, you know, he was kind of addressing the same talking points maybe over and over again. But I guess it it wasn't quite as detrimental to me because the, the film itself is about an artist kind of spinning his wheels, trying to kind of figure out where he is in this place in his life. And I don't know, it felt very, uh, purposeful and it felt, uh, uh, you know, it, it felt, uh, appropriate, I guess is the word, I guess, for this yeah. particular film. I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think that if this is his epitaph, it's a very fitting one because 
you can just you can tell he's purposely being like I'm the I'm Vigo Mortensen here. I I'm literally like giving myself, you know, sacrificing pieces of my body for art, you know. And I think that it's it's all laid bare. And my favorite things about this movie, Quite I will literally. say like, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that I think the world building is really exceptional. And I do think that my favorite thing about the movie is his sort of, you kind of were touching on it, but like his tender approach to how sexuality could evolve in the future and how, you know, there's that line. I, I heard it's in the trailer. I haven't seen the trailer yet, but the idea that like surgery is the new sex and it's Which, just exploring like, yeah, yeah, uh, like, that's how some people will get their rocks off at some point. Uh, yeah. Like doing surgery on each other. Why not? I mean, that has to be like the most Cronenberg line that Cronenberg has ever written. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah surgery is a new well, there sex is a character i won't yeah. i won't give it away but one character is like i'm not good at the sex <laughs> uh, uh, i'm not so good at the old sex yeah, yeah um yeah. that's a yeah, great yeah. line yeah um which that's the thing it's like it's it, and on the one hand that, that those are the things that had me thinking you know with the with the movie being like huh you know the the way that human desire evolves over time it, it always changes you know the way that humans are intimate with each other it's so different now than it was a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, however long. And it, it's just interesting to see a, a filmmaker kind of be on the vanguard of exploring what that could mean. I, I just wish he had done it in a more interesting vessel of a story, not really doing the detective story thing and this plot involving plastic bars. And th these to me were like the least interesting things beyond like their own little minor what if scenarios but no i mean i'm not gonna, i'm not gonna say it's a bad movie i just think that it's it's extremely inaccessible because i do think that it on the one hand i, I don't think it's it, the body horror i kind of I, I do think it's a little tame compared to what he's done before so i think like the real hardcore cronenberg fans the ones who come to his movies for that i don't know why they do but uh if that's all you want from him then you might be disappointed but sure. if you're a little bit more of like a well-rounded like you pay more attention to what Cronenberg is saying, not necessarily like the the blood and vomit inducing stuff. Uh, I, I think that's where the mileage is going to vary. But you, uh, yeah, you say that, but I have heard reports uh, of people like passing out watching this movie. Which I mean, I agree with you. I think I found it to be a fairly tame, not particularly gory or violent film. But you know, uh, if you if you are uh, squeamish about some surgery stuff, it, it may. Uh, it may get under your skin in more ways. I, I, yeah. I mean, I'm sure some people, yeah. I mean, I, that's not something that gets me particularly squeamish, but I totally understand it might be for some others. I think with Khan, um, there was a lot of like hype around that. of like, oh my gosh, mass walkouts. But apparently they were kind of overblown. Uh, oh, well, I, you're telling me that a report <laughs> from Khan was overblown. <laughs> you said it right. Yeah. Well, you're growing up. Um, no, yeah, but like, I, I think it was, uh, Amanda the Jedi who kind of was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, there were like some walkouts, but they weren't during the, like the gross stuff. Like people were kind of like, people always walk out of these things like Sundance people walk out just cause like, they don't want to watch the movie. <laughs> like it's kind of a very common festival thing. And well, according also, to like, her, people weren't uh, walking out during the gross stuff. They were walking out during like kind of those slower scenes. Yeah. Also, I think people account like like there are a lot of like agents and producers and things that have to like get mm -hmm. calls and things like that. So you never know like why exactly people are walking out. But, you know, right. it's fun to make that narrative, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, she also mentioned, by the way, because um, uh, she did she did a video about this man of the Jedi is a friend of the podcast. Uh, I was I was hoping to get her on for this, but the scheduling just didn't, you know, could not have happened. Did she like the film? I, did, I haven't had a chance to see this video recap. But I've been trying to keep up with her uh, con coverage. Yeah, I think she liked the film. I don't think she was like over the moon for it. I think she was okay. kind of maybe in between me and you. Sure. I mean, to be clear, like I, I like the film, but I'm not like this isn't like the next crash, the next video drone, the next um, naked lunch for me, like I or next dead ringers or something. Like I, I feel like it's good, but I don't think it's like a tier Cronenberg, but I do really quite enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's worth a watch for a certain type of moviegoer. It's up to you, I think, the listener, to decide if that person is you. Uh, should we play the Rotten Tomatoes game? I, I genuinely have no idea what you might guess. Um, Sure. I mean, can we talk about Kristen Stewart? We kind of skirted around it, and I feel like that's one of the more uh, entertaining things to discuss. I, I didn't have much else to add, so I'm all ears. What did you want to add to the discussion? 
I hope the all ears thing is a, a pun on the film, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know yeah. if that was deliberate or not. But um, yeah, I I just I feel like she was destined to be in a Cronenberg film. Like, you know, like she's someone, as we kind of discussed in our Spencer review last year, who uh, I think at her best is someone who really channels her inherent sort of discomfort and anxiety with like being alive and her fame, uh, you know, in her like real life and like channeling this sort of like awkwardness and vulnerability that she brings to screen while also having this kind of like intensity and drive at the same time and i feel like she was uh you know a perfect fit for a cronenberg movie uh, you know a guy who like excels at you know making movies where people are just inherently horrified with having a human body because having a human body is you know a terrifying thing uh <laughs> in my opinion but um <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I, I saw her performance uh, was just really fun. I, I was uh, laughing and chuckling to myself uh, throughout all of her scenes. So it seems like that's a, a point of conflict because some people huh. are trying to pay a narrative. She gave a bad performance in this film. No, I don't think she gave a bad performance, but I'm not seeing where she gave like as impactful of performance as you seem to be picking no, no, up no, on. I, I felt like she was almost like kind of a side character with some like a handful of interesting scenes. Well, what I was trying to say or what I was building up to is that not so much I think that she's giving like the performance of her career in this film. I'm not trying to suggest as much. I'm rather saying that I, if Cronenberg does continue to make films, I really hope he works with her again. Oh, I do agree with that. I mean, when I when I saw that he was talking about bringing Robert Pattinson and Christmas yeah. together for a movie that he directed, like bring it. I think. Yeah, I be, want that. I hope I, th that I think I think we're ready. I think I think we've come around I mean, as a culture. Uh, full circle on the Twilight mm -hmm. movies. And I think it's time for those two to just like, just rule the world you know, sure. cinematically. I mean, well, once again, I'm ready. You're ready. I'm ready too. Uh, the listeners hopefully are ready, but are yeah. they ready? That's the question. <laughs> oh, That's they've a, been ready. You think so? I mean, are they oh, like yeah. cool? Yeah, they're they buddies. Just, okay. Cause you know, cause they have the public fallout. So I don't, I didn't know if that was, uh, Oh, that was years ago. I feel like, no, if, like I don't want to. I don't want to say. I don't know them personally. Um, I okay. genuinely don't. Um, okay. I'm literally googling right now. Robert Pattinson, Kristen Stewart. Are they cool okay. <laughs> <laughs> with each other? I got to be a little bit more. I mean, specific. either way, they are very much friendly, but also very private too. Okay. Rob does not talk much about Kristen out of respect for once they once shared and where they mm -hmm. are at now in their relationship. I mean, even if they weren't like completely cool, they could that tension could add something to the film so, exactly I mean, yeah um Look, yeah they were they were kids okay you know Young they needs. yeah they had they had, a, they had a bit of a they had a bit of a relationship right for a long time and i mean more I than a bit i mean they were dating yeah, for a years. while right yeah yeah years. i was gonna say it, it was a while they they dated for you know not a small period of time and you know since then you know kristen stewart has come out and has embraced you know a kind of a new chapter for her her how she presents and her sexuality and i think robert pattinson and her have had truly like outstanding careers as actors and yeah i think it's time i think i think they might be ready but you know what that's their decision to make not ours well uh i hope it happens that's all Me i can too. really say and I, at the very least if that doesn't happen i just hope kristen stewart can reunite with cronenberg one or two or more times after this because i just think you know if this performance uh, is any indication she really just fits well in cronenberg's vibe um, it's a point where I was, I mean, I, th I think Leah Sado is good, but I was kind of wondering like if she was in that role, like what would she do with it? Uh, I thought, but I, think I thought she was kind of the, yeah. I, I thought Leah Sado was my favorite performance. Oh, really? um, I, I mean, think she's I, really I, good in it, but, uh, I think all the performances are good. Uh, but why is, uh, why in particular was she your favorite? Cause she's like the moral center of it. More like Leah Seduce. Um, <laughs> no, I think with her, I think the way that she sort of like carries the Vigo Mortensen character uh, in terms of like his support partner, but then also stands out on her own and strikes mm -hmm. out. Um, I think the way that she like performs the surgeries and the way that she sort of engages with him in those like very tender moments, like to me, I think made that like dynamic between the two characters really work. Mortensen, I, I'm not going to say he was one note. Uh, I thought I thought he was very good. I thought like his best scenes were when he's like walking around in a shawl, basically like 
coughing through all of his words snarfing um, and yeah oh i yeah, i thought yeah. all that was fantastic uh by I the way i thought that was great yeah um but i think that like say was really like his moral center and but she was also her own character with her own set of principles and ideas and i think that's such a hard thing to do as an actor because she could have so easily fallen into his shadow because in some ways the part is almost written that way but the fact mm-hmm. that she doesn't i think is a credit to her as an actor so and and of course uh, i think cronenberg's direction too but yeah i think they go hand in hand yeah and i i just really appreciate kind of going back like i said to the the meta narrative of the film uh, I, I mean, I see her character as being basically um, uh, his wife, who unfortunately passed away mm. in 2017. Um, and just because she was an editor and a filmmaker as well. And I think they collaborated together on uh, more than a few occasions. And yeah. I feel like, yeah, I, I think their scenes together that adds, I think, that tenderness of the film and just that that sense of reflection and that that sense of like kind of fearing mortality but also kind of being intrigued by it in that very human morbid way uh yeah i I, that's where i kind of find myself uh really fascinated that this movie was written 20 years prior because i feel like those scenes feel like something he could have written in the past few years like just reflecting on his relationship his grief uh, just like his, like kind of just own mortality at this point. I just, I just think those scenes are re- the movie really just comes to life, especially their last, uh, couple scenes together. I just think are outstanding. Yeah. Well said, well said. All right. Well, let's do the Rotten Tomatoes game. Then crimes of the future has been out for a little while. Uh, we're getting to it about a week after it's wide release and on the tomato meter on Rotten Tomatoes. 167 reviews have been counted a little bit more than I expected. Actually, I I wasn't expecting this one to be like super like, you know, across the board, like everybody's reviewing it. But yeah, a lot of people are. Well, Ashton, what do you think they're on tomato scores right now? I mean, it was basically the wide release of last week, right? It was kind of the buffer. It was a buffer film between Top Gun and Jurassic Park. Yeah, but I mean, it had Fire Island, had Benediction, a few other things coming out. Sure. Well, well, Fire Island was a streaming title, to be clear. But I mean, like in theaters, uh, that was like the yeah. the most wide release. Because I, I think Benediction was a limited release. Uh, sure, sure. From Roseside. Um, but uh, as, to answer your question, I'm going to guess this is in the 70s range. Like 70s seems like the place where like most people like it or in your case, like respect it, even if they don't like fully embrace the film. And like I said, I feel like some people are really like through the roof. Like this is a triumph from Cronenberg, a return to form in the truest sense and all that. And some are like, yeah, I get what it's going for. I like it. I think it's well made. I think it's interesting, uh, you know, thematically, but not really my thing. And some people are just like, what is this? <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, so I think it's going to be like a, like 72%. It is not 72%, but do you think it's higher or lower than what you just guessed? Uh, I think most people respect Cronenberg, so I'm going to say higher. Good choice. It's 77%. So yeah, uh, five points higher. You, uh, you're pretty close though. Uh, definitely in the right zone. All right. What about audience score? We have a hundred plus verified ratings. Where do you think this one went? Well, that's the question, right? The, the, this is, could be anything. Uh, I'm going to say 64%. It's not 64. Do you think higher or lower? Uh, oh, let's say lower. <laughs> Good choice. Forty five percent. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty low. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, on in one hand, it's not that surprising. On the other hand, yeah, you, you want to hope that, you know, the, the people who wanted to see this came out, saw it and were like, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it doesn't seem to be the case. I think people, you know, audiences were like, well, Top Gun sold out. <laughs> like, Kristen Stewart, Hugo Mortensen, like, yeah. too, from from No Time to Die. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, I just imagine, you know, like some Midwestern dad, you know, all decked <laughs> out in his like Navy attire. He's wearing sold out. <laughs> he's sitting there with the aviator sunglasses on in the even though he's in the theater, uh, got like the like a hat on, you know, like large sitting popcorn. there. And he's just like, I am so confused yet horny right now. I don't know how to feel. Zero percent on Ryan. <laughs> Yeah. Or no, what? Right. he's the one that's going out there being like, I don't get it, but yeah. it provoked me. <laughs> there we Four go. out of five stars. But yeah, Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart should definitely. All right. So on Letterboxd, 
We have yeah. 27,000 people have logged it. Which, no uh, cinema score? No cinema score. I looked it up and uh, yeah. No, They're no still thinking score. it over. <laughs> they need some extra time. But 27,000 is a lot more for this movie than I was expecting. Uh, even for wide release kind of art house films, usually they're in the teens, but this is almost 30,000. So the letterbox community came out for this one. Um, I mean, that ma- I guess it makes sense because Cronenberg is basically a celebrity on this site. But and, uh, yeah, uh, we- mm-hmm. isn't neon doesn't don't they have a deal with letterbox or something like they're like connect the letterbox some way or another? Uh, this I is can't a neon for sure. Title. Um, I thought, I don't know. I just feel like they well, do a lot of stuff with letterbox. It's kind of neon. It, it's, it's actually kind of confusing the relationship between this movie and neon because Miramax is distributing it in France and the production companies are all like, there are a lot of them. It, it's not like a full, like they're marketing it and everything, but it's, yeah. uh, I'll just say it's a little dicey how it's work. I mean, it's my understanding. Yeah. And I mean like that, that relationship with like trouble producers is, also baked into the film so sure. uh yeah but i mean yeah i mean I, I think most of the recent cronenberg films fall in that category of like 15 random european uh production companies are involved with it exactly, uh, certainly yeah. i think this was filmed in greece uh maybe athens but uh i think just greece in some some fashion or another so i imagine a lot of greek productions were involved or whatever so yeah, whatever it, it is in, you're right yeah. it was in athens greece but um and Neon did produce or did distribute uh, his son's film, Possessor. But anyway, yeah. Letterboxd, zero to five. What do you think? Um, 3.4? Spot on. Really? Well, I'm getting no. a little alarmed, actually, because lately your Letterbox pr- like guesses have been, I think this is like your third or fourth in a row that was spot on. Fingers on the pulse. Are you, psych- are you psychic? Almost I a guess, psycho, but we all yeah. know. <laughs> Fingers on the pulse there, I guess. I don't know. Well done, well done. Uh, last question for you then, since we don't have a cinema score. Sure. What do you think the box office is? Worldwide box office. Worldwide, uh, it has to be under twelve million. Like, there's no way this has like probably like eight point five. Ooh, one point five. One point. Oh, okay. So I was uh, highballing it. It's uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what did this I would have guessed US? probably around five million. So I would have been a little bit higher too. Yeah. Uh, what did this do this past weekend? This past weekend, like uh, uh, the domestic opening was 1.1. One. Okay. So that was, uh, yeah, what I spot think just was that? what spot? Yeah, like top 10. Yeah, I mean, it's in, it's in the top 10 of the summer right now because the top 10 is still like really shaping. But yeah, I meant for the weekend. Not. But for the not weekend? For the, yeah. I don't know. I'd have okay. to look. Okay. I, I assume it was higher, you know. Because there aren't a lot of like, like Doctor Strange really is slowing down. You really only have like Top Gun, Doctor Strange, maybe f- I think Firestarter is basically gone at this point. I, I don't know. <laughs> Men and like other movies about. like that, they're not really playing anymore, are they? Yeah, I guess I forgot about Firestarter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, next but week, was though. Just, yeah. Next Jurassic week, we're going to be talking about a movie that's probably going to blow <laughs> a lot of films out of the top 10 in yeah. terms of the summer. Uh, Jurassic You're- World Dominion, which we already saw. Your prediction for the highest grossing film of this ongoing summer. Domestically, I, I yeah. think it'll do it, but I'm increasingly wondering if Top Gun Maverick is actually going to be the number I one I was going to say, I mean, you know, it, it, it has legs. It did yeah. fantastic uh, that first weekend. And that's, it, that's it's not dropping. Or you mean Doctor yeah. Strange? No, 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 I'm talking Top Gun Maverick. Like, no, but it, you it, said it beat Fantastic? Sorry, it it uh, it opened fantastic, and it it, it like um, oh, oh. it has it it has legs. It hasn't dropped much in the second weekend. Yeah, like, record clearly, low drops. But but here's the thing though, yeah. it does it hasn't, it hasn't had competition. <laughs> well, that's the, the thing. The, the, the thing though is that people seem to be not only going to this film who haven't been to the movies in a while, in addition to people who are going to the movies, but people are going back to it. They're seeing it more than once. Like they they want that theatrical experience again and again. Is that going to happen with Jurassic World? I'm going to say probably not because we've seen the movie and we know what the quality of it is. But I don't know for sure. But I I never uh, discount people's reverent uh, ravi, uh, uh, rapturous was the word I was trying to say uh, love of dinosaurs uh, <laughs> as made evident from the last uh, couple Jurassic Park films. So that's what I was going to say. I was like, Fallen Kingdom did not get great reviews, but. 
it certainly made a ton of money domestically, way right. more than I think Top Gun is. I, I think that Top Gun, it, you know, it's made a lot of money, but I think as Jurassic World Dominion and Lightyear come out over the next couple of weeks, it's going to be in fewer screens. And I think the people who loved it have already watched it and are probably going to move on by then. And Maybe. I think I think Top Gun Maverick is going to peter out at around like 400, between four to 450 million domestic, which is mm-hmm. super great. I think it's going to be like number two, number three, maybe. But I, I just think Jurassic World is going to make like almost like a, half of what Top Gun has made in like three weeks. Sure. In one week. And I think that's what's going to happen. And I think it's going to like just kind of zoom past it. But I could be totally wrong. I uh, also I think yeah. I think the Top Gun probably will make more than Lightyear or be kind of neck and neck with Lightyear, depending on how that goes, because <laughs> the reviews have come out for Lightyear or like the social yeah, embargo the lifted and it's kind of all over the place. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I don't I don't really know what the, the general read on that film is, because I've seen a lot of high reactions. And I've seen a lot of middling to negative reactions to that film. Yeah. I don't um, know. But I don't know. I mean, that's a question for another week. Uh, I was just thinking, uh, I mean, to your point with Top Gun, it is going to be leaving, I'd say, most, if not all, like IMAX and Dolby screens uh, this upcoming week with, uh, you know, Jurassic Park filling those up. So our Jurassic World, rather, uh, filling up those screens. So, you know, that might, uh, you know. Uh, damper Top Gun's box office uh, for the weeks to follow. However, I don't know how long uh, Jurassic World is going to be able to stay in IMAX and Dolby screens because I believe Lightyear is going to fill them up the week after. So That's true, but the, here, here's the thing. I think that the success of Top Gun Maverick is going to bleed into Jurassic World. I think Top Gun Maverick got people to be like, man, the movies are fun. It, it kind of brought people out to the theater. And I think it could have that effect on like, hey, let's go again. Oh, we already saw Top Gun. Let's watch Jurassic, the new Jurassic Park movie. I'm just saying, yeah. I think that we've seen that before. And even though Jurassic World Dominion is a lesser film, <laughs> like I remember yeah. like we, we were leaving Jurassic World Dominion. And I mean, I didn't hate Jurassic World Dominion. I don't think it's that bad, but I, I, I think remember, it's pretty bad. But we'll talk I remember about that my wife is like, later. Well, is it better? Do, did you do you think Top Gun was better? Immediately, I was like, yes, hundred percent. Of course, yes, Top Gun Maverick, so much yeah. better. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even a question. Like, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, but, yeah. Like you said, conversation for another week. Um, mm-hmm. We'll be back. We'll talk about Jurassic World Dominion. We'll talk about Fire Island. It's going to be great. We're going to have lots of fun conversations this summer. But for now, we're going to leave you there. Thanks for listening to our our wacky review of Crimes of the Future. I, I, that was a lot wacky. of fun. Yeah, I, I, I think, think it's pretty wacky. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll see you on the next one. From the Internet of California, I'm John DeGroy. And from Pennsylvania, I'm Washington. See you next time.